Hi, this is Amy. I'm back with another essay. And this time I have another extra special collaboration essay with Lo the Lynx. If you watched my Orientalism in His Dark Materials in colonial dis uh, colonialism discussion, you saw Lo the Lynx, you've seen them before. Hopefully you've read their amazing analysis that they have on their WordPress. So please check them out. All the links will be in the description, please. Oh, I can never do this right. Remember in the bottom right hand corner, there's a little icon of me and please hit that so you can subscribe and hit that little bell so you know when I'm going live or when I post a new video. I will be going live this Tuesday, December 22nd at 5 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to have John from John Webster Film on who I co-host uh, with on his movie channel every Saturdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. And he's going to come on and we're going to start a new series I call Buddy Banter which is where I have a friend on to talk about a topic of their choice. And John chose the topic of gender stereotypes and how they affect uh, how we consume media. So he, as a man, was told you can't like romance. And then I, as a woman, was told, of course you like romance, you know? And he was told you should like action movies, right? So we're gonna talk about that. And that'll be the first episode of Buddy Banter. And I'm hoping to have lots of wonderful friends, um, especially fandom friends on to talk about whatever they wanna talk about. So that's coming at you Tuesday. And this will be those two, this video, and then that live stream will be it for me in December, but please stick around for 2021. I've got a lot of content coming at you. Gonna continue a Song of Ice and Fire, His Dark Materials. And then I'm going to do The Poppy War, which if you have not read that series, please read it. I'm gonna have Lo back on to talk about that uh, in 2021. I'm also going to start some uh, Avatar The Last Airbender and The Witcher content as well. So a lot going on this channel. So please hit that subscribe so you know what's up. Like I said, please look at the description for those links for Lo. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read the essay that Lo and I wrote and please stick around because after I'm done reading it, Lo is going to come on and we're gonna talk all about Lysono Mar. So please stick around for that. So here comes the essay. Oh, also one more plug. San Rixian shop is open again. If you saw my Circe video, please check that out. I had Rohan on to talk about it. Um, you saw me drink from a Targaryen uh, mug, and this time I have a House Valarion mug, so please, please check that out. Also, I'm going to show off my Christmas nails because they took me forever to do. So yes, please check out Stan Rhee's shop. I will have the link in the description. Uh, she has leggings, bedspreads, masks, cups, you know, uh, hoodies, whatever you want, she's got it. So please check that out. All right, here comes the essay coming at you. And this essay, written by Lo the Lynx and me, Amy Blackfire is called The Beautiful Spymaster, Lysonomar, Orientalism, and Luminality. Lysonomar is a minor character that was introduced in A Dance with Dragons and is the master of whispers for the Golden Company. Like Varys, he is constantly feminized by other characters and is met with suspicion and contempt. This is due to his office, his foreignness, and his good looks. There was a similar mistrust for, uh, for foreign masters of whispers in the case of Tyana, one of Magor, King Magor's wives who was from Pentos. Mar being feminized is in line with the common Orientalist trope of men from the East being seen as less masculine and, uh, than those in the West. Orientalist tropes were first systematically theorized in Edward Said's 1978 work, Orientalism. Said details how the East is homogenized, exoticized, eroticized, infantilized, and degraded in the Western psyche. And I have an essay on this, uh, on Orientalism and His Dark Materials, and that, once again, that discussion with the wonderful Lo the Link, so please check that out. And um, I've also talked about Orientalism and A Song of Ice and Fire um, on Through the Moon Door with my friend Yogi. Um, so please check that out as well. I will also have those links in the description. And particularly, I talked about uh, Orientalism and Daenerys Targaryen storyline. So if you want more on Orientalism, that's the place to go. So the city of Lys itself is an example of an Orientalist trope. It is known for being ostentatious and having pleasure houses to serve all sorts of tastes and uh, have sex workers of all exotic types. Their religion is also sexualized. In A Fire and Blood, we learn of uh, Indros of the Twilight, which is male by day and female by night. And acolytes allegedly change from male to female through the act of coitus. This is further uh, Orientalist uh, as it is not, <clears throat> pardon me, as it not only hypersexualizes Lyceni, 
but it also inspire, it's also inspired by the Taoist theory of yin and yang, where yin is the dark, shady, the night, the moon, and female, and yang is light, the day, the sun, which is male. And I have a forthcoming 2021 essay about yin yang symbolism and a song of ice and fire. Don't you worry, that is coming at you. So um, <clears throat> the way to worship Indros of the Twilight is described in Fire and Blood as um, it also makes it clear that this moving between gender positions is viewed with suspicion and contempt. This all situates the people of Lys and Essos as a whole in a liminal space uh, when it comes to the gender binary. Um, so like this is like Lysona Mar himself. Mar is also the spy master of the Golden Company and the non-Westerosi, uh, which adds to the suspicion. He is one of the many examples of the trope of the foreign spy, like we see with other characters such as Varys, and we will discuss uh, that further in this essay. Given that he appears in the fifth book and has many parallels with Varys, Mar could have been a product of the scrapped five-year gap, and his plot lines were actually, uh, you know, five years later, Varys' plot lines. So Lysonomar being Lysini and having the name that derived from Lys can be connected with the or this orientalist feminized uh, erotic image. Because of his woman-like appearance, he is underestimated and degraded. <clears throat> we see the, this orientalist trope in our world, especially during the turn of the 20th century, when Asian men were painted as weak and feminine, uh, with China literally being described as the sick man, sick man of Asia. This was in contrast to Western men who were conceived as strong, healthy, and capable. This then adds to the infantilization of the East, seeing it as a land in need of strong Western hand to correct its backwards culture. We see that when uh, characters such as young Griff and Ariane Martel meet Lysonomar, they are automatically suspicious of him being a leader in a sellsword company, which evokes masculine connotations. So we first meet Mar in A Dance with Dragons in a John Connington POV chapter where John Griff uh, describes him thus, quote, the spy master was new to Griff, a Lyceni named Lysono Mar with lilac eyes and white gold hair and lips that would have been the envy of a whore. At first glance, Griff had almost taken him for a woman. His fingernails were painted purple and his earlobes dripped with pearls and amethysts. And that's from A Dance with Dragons, the Lost Lord chapter. Our first uh, introduction to Mar automatically frames him with a feminine lens. He is described with painted fingernails, wearing jewelry and beautiful lips, all features that are associated with feminine beauty. The reference to sex workers is also an example of the Orientalist trope of sexualizing Easterners. His use of nail polish and jewelry can be tied to his home city of Lys, which is known for its ostentatious luxury. In fact, Lys is heavily associated with women throughout the series. Besides the city of Lys and Lysona Mar, we also have Lysa Aaron, Alyssa's Tears, and the Poison Tears of Lys, which is described in Game of Thrones, uh, Eddard V, it's said that poison is a woman's we a weapon for women, cravens, and eunuchs. Martin appears to be establishing a theme here. Lysona Mar being just one of many parts of this larger uh, picture of Lys being connected with feminine features. Another important part of our introduction to the character is his Targaryen-like features. This is pointed out directly in one of the released Winds of Winter chapters. Quote, near dusk on the fourth day, not long after Chain and his wagons were taken, uh, um, were taken their leave of them, Ariane's company was met by a column of swords down from Griffin's Roost, led by the most exotic creature that the princess had ever laid her eyes on with painted fingernails and gemstones sparkly in his ears. Lysono Mar spoke the common tongue very well. I have the honor to be the eyes and ears of the Golden Company, Princess. You look, she, Ariane, hesitated. Like a woman, he laughed. That I am not. Like a Targaryen, Ariane insisted. His eyes were a pale lilac, his hair a waterfall of white and gold. At the same time, something about him made her skin crawl. Was this what Viserys looked like? She found herself wondering. If so, perhaps this is a good thing that he is dead. I am flattered. The women of House Targaryen are said to be without peer in all the world. That's from the Winds of Winter, Ariana, uh, Ariane, 
I'm a big fan of Ariana Grande. Sorry about that. <laughs> the winds, that's from the winds of winter, Ariane too. And that is a forthcoming chapter. And, and um, please note that when we do get the winds of winter, that might have uh, changed when we get it uh, in print. So it is obvious that Mar has been seen as feminine before and is not surprised when Ariane does the same. He is also exoticized and otherized, a classic feature of Orientalism. Ariane is uncomfortable with Mar as a liminal character who does not fit in with the expectations for how a man should look. While many in the fandom note that Ariane is sex positive, we should acknowledge that she understands the world through the heterosexual binary. People like Mar do not fit into this binary and therefore become exotic creatures in her eyes. A challenge of analyzing gender in A Song of Ice and Fire is that it's sometimes unclear what conceptualization of gender one should use in the analysis. Throughout human history and throughout different cultures, people have understood gender differently. The current Western view of sex and gender as two separate binary categories only really goes back to the 18th century, and that's from Maltier 2008. Um, as the source. Uh, before then, sex was understood according to the one sex body model, which conceptualized women's bodies as similar but inferior versions of, males bo of male bodies, um, with female genitals being thought of as internal much, and much smaller versions of the male genitals. And that's from Mottier 2008, um, page 33. Based on that, one might think that it would be logical to use that this conceptualization of sex or gender, uh, sex gen, uh, and gender, to analyze a Song of Ice and Fire characters. But if one looks closely at the text, it does clear. It, it is seems clear <clears throat> that this isn't actually the way that sex and gender is understood in the story. Instead, the way characters seem to understand sex and gender uh, seems much more in line with the post 18th century understanding, which sees men and women as fundamentally biologically different, a view that has been used to justify social equality. And that's from um, Scheibinger, uh, 1986. We see this in the way that Mars underestimated by appearing feminine and therefore seen as unqualified for being a sellsword company. Furthermore, Georgia R. Martin lives in our current times and as Shiloh Carroll put, puts it, quote, a Song of Ice and Fire examines contemporary concerns or anxieties while placing them in a far distant past, allowing the reader to consider them at a distance. And that's from Carol 2018, page seven. More specifically, Martin has even said that he believes that most people of the Middle Ages were not very different from people of today when it comes to love, sex, and sexuality. And that's also from um, Carol, uh, page 83. In light of that, it seems fair to use uh, a contemporary lens and contemporary theories to analyze sex and gender in A Song of Ice and Fire. One interesting way that contemporary uh, gender and transgender scholars have discussed the, the, the sort of gender nonconformity that for instance, Lysona Mar embodies is by discussing what might be called the liminal space between normative gender categories. Queer theorist Judith Butler refers to this as the domain of the abject, a space inhabited by those who don't fit into the normative coherent gender. And that's from her 1993 work. Butler argues that normative gender is constructed in relation to this abject, i.e. that which is normal is, specific, it <clears throat> is specifically that which is not whatever abnormal thing the queer folk are up to. Trans scholar Susan Stryker has noted the this affects trans people in the sense that Trans people have to choose between either being seen as incoherently gendered in the eyes of society, i.e. not making sense, or forcing themselves to fit into the very structure that disavowed them in the first place. And that's from 19, her 1994 work. Um, essentially, either accept the rules of the game or be completely excluded. Another trans scholar, Marquis Bay, uh, discusses a similar concept when writing about how, for instance, a Black and or trans person might navigate a public space, and that's from 2019. He does this specifically by discussing what uh, he names a dweller in, uh, in his college town. And I am now quoting directly from Bay. Uh, Rejecting the state sanctioned norms of public space, a space that is governed by gender norms and rules about how bodies can uh, and should appear. The dweller in the under commons in my college town 
as a ver veritable fugitive, perhaps even, I would argue queer seizes public space, a space uh, by virtue of its publicness that is normatively marked. They are sinful. They seize the space, queer it, and lay claim to the right uh, to appear or not strategically or uh, dis <laughs> desultorily, I can never say that word, desultorily uh, dissembling and deploying their unintelligibility, thus challenging both racial and gendered assumptions of space. By appearing in public space precisely as a troubling body uh, that is assumed to be disallowed from the realm of the public, they laid claim to the public while simultaneously occupying their undercommons. The dweller of the undercommons refuses to comply with the law, the law of categorizable bodies, the law of public property or propriety, the law of proper gender performances. The dweller in the undercommons holds in their subjectivity heat that can conflagrates normative space. They embody volatility. Put boldly and simply, the dweller of the, of the undercommons is a fucking problem, a gendered outlaw. They uh, exist para lawlessly and question the logic of laws presumed to be infallible, fixed, axiomatic. And that's from Bay 2019, uh, pages 128 to 129. Bay here notes something important. Certain types of bodies, certain types, certain types of bodies, certain types of gendered embodiment, for instance, are not welcome in public space. If they're allowed to exist at all, they're expected to keep it to the shadows. When appearing in public and taking up space, they're viewed with suspicion because they won't conform to the norm. In many ways, uh, this is similar to the position eunuchs had in, in antiquity, which Lowe has written about in their essay about varies. And please, everyone, check that out. Um, the eunuch was often positioned as a liminal person in ancient Greece specifically, neither fully man nor woman, with neither East, Western nor Eastern. In Greece, uh, eunuchs were often associated with Persia. In early modern China, eunuchs were allowed to be assistants to the emperor's concubines because they could not impregnate them, being allowed into the inner quarters of the females of the court. They often became advisors to the emperor and sometimes even took over ruling the Chinese empire altogether, like with Wei Zhongqian, who ruled from 1620 to 1627. In Chinese culture, eunuchs uh, were seen as men who were stripped of their manhood, but were dangerous and encouraged suspicion, especially because castration uh, was often a punishment for disobedience. Um, because the eunuch had the uh, liminal and transgressive role, uh, had this liminal and transgressive role, he could move between different spaces more easily than other people. For instance, he became privy to the intrigue of the private female sphere and could pass on that information to the public male sphere. As Lowe noted in their Varys essay, this is, of course, very similar to Varys's role as the Master of Whispers. Lysone Omar isn't a eunuch. But he does transgress gendered boundaries in a similar way to Varys, and he too moves between the public and private, between the light and the shadows as a master of whispers, uh, serving as the spy master for the Golden Company. It's interesting to note that several of the masters of whispers we hear of in A Song of Ice and Fire fit this mold to a certain degree. For instance, Blood Raven, who was looked upon with suspicion both for his magic and his disability, and Masaria, the white worm, who was seen as a sexual transgressor, among other things. Uh, one can note that Masaria, similarly to Varys and my son Omar, was also from Lys. So they also have that in common. There's also Tyana of the Tower, who was the mistress of Whisper to Magor the, Magor the first Targaryen, who was of Pentos and wielded a massive amount of power compared to most women in Westerosi society. What we can see here is how, uh, <clears throat> how the Master Whisperer's role seems to be filled by someone that's looked down upon by society, someone who is an outcast in some way. Being the Master of Whisperers is perhaps not seen as an honorable position, given that the power isn't as traditionally masculine as the power of someone who, say, the Master of Ships would have. This is perhaps a bit similar to how poison is seen as a weapon of women, eunuchs, and foreigners, unlike a more straightforward masculine weapon like a sword. But just like poison, a master of whispers has its uses in court politics and intrigues, so the position is filled by outcasts. 
uh, who are already looked down upon. What we can see with all of these Master of Whispers characters then, including Mar, is that those who don't conform to gendered and sexual norms are often looked upon with suspicion and are expected to keep to the shadows. This might, on the other hand, give them a more, more of a familiarity with the shadows, which is useful as a, for instance, Master of Whispers. But we do also see that they are mistreated for their transgression and obviously not treated as equals. This is, the, this is in many ways similar to the experiences of trans and gender nonconforming people in our world, uh, since violence towards them uh, are as often justified by the um, perpetrators by pointing towards their transgression. And that's from uh, Betcher, uh, 2007. Um, people and society expect that everyone's gender and gender expression match the sex that they were assigned to at birth. And if they don't, uh, somehow they are seen as suspicious and violence toward them is deemed legitimate. Now, we don't see any direct physical violence toward Lysonomar, but it's clear that his gender expression is looked on with contempt. Going forward, with the series, we can expect more suspicion and underestimation directed at Lysol Nomar. Uh, but as with many underestimated characters in Martin's series, we must pay extra attention to characters such as these. Like with Bran Stark and Tyrion Lannister, the characters that are most underestimated have the most potential to influence the larger storyline. Characters like these are, are looked down upon by society for not conforming to the norm in different ways but they still, manage, uh, they still manage to gain power. Um, Lo the Lynx has written before uh, about both, that both Tyrion and Bran are unmanly because of their disabilities. And that way, uh, similar to how Mar is underestimated because of his gender expression. But we expect that both Tyrion and Bran to have a larger impact on the end game of Thrones. Um, so perhaps similarly to those Master of Whispers that came before him, Mar will end up having a similar rise to power. Mar might at first appear to be a minor character of no importance, but he is certainly important to the young Griff plot and has the potential to influence the Song of Ice and Fire endgame. When young Griff falls, if Mar is still active, he might join Daenerys Targaryen or the resistance against her. Either way, he is calculating and not impulsive, meaning that he would be a powerful ally or perhaps similar to those who came before him, he will also crash and fall in the end. So that is our essay. And now I'm going to bring in my wonderful co-author and uh, my uh, fellow panelists for today, Lo the Links to talk about it. Hello, Lo. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on my channel again. And like I said, we have, uh, you have been on my channel before to talk about Orientalism in His Dark Materials. And I'm glad to have you back. Um, I'm gonna shut my window so I don't have this right here, so I'm gonna be right back. Okay, so much for natural lighting. Hello, Lo. <laughs> Hi. Um, and like I said, please check out Lo's links. They are in the description. Um, they have a wonderful blog um, called Queer Musings, where they do um, amazing feminist queer analysis of um, Song of Ice and Fire, His Dark Materials, and more. And Lo, you're also um, doing an episode by episode of a season or series two of um, His Dark Materials. You want to talk about that a little bit before we get started? Yeah, sure. Um, that was really inspired by me having the amazing opportunity to guest on an episode of Girls Gone Canon for the first episode of this season. Uh, and that was so much fun that I was like, I need to continue writing about this season. Uh, so I have put out uh, breakdowns of episode two till six and episode seven is upcoming uh, after i've seen it this week and you unfortunately are in unfortunately for me you're in west you're in um uh western would you would you call sweden western europe you would right yeah 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 you're in western europe so you get the you get the episode a week before me so i have to wait until i've seen it before i can read your write-up and that is just really frustrating for me um <laughs> but yes yeah, so everyone please check that out if you're his dark materials fan um 
And Lo also has read the main series as well as the Books of Dust trilogy. So they have a lot of uh, knowledge that they're able to also bring in. So um, if you're a show watcher uh, and you're like, I don't kind of get what's going on, Lo is definitely um, the, the person to read for that. Um, awesome. So let's let's talk about Lysona Omar. And first of all, maybe just a little bit about um, your work in uh, gender studies, because I am a PhD student of Chinese literature and I'm getting something called a graduate feminist emphasis, which means that basically I'm like, uh, you know, piggybacking off of people in the gender and sexuality studies department. So I'm like taking classes in the GSS and writing papers, but I'm not a full major of, of gender and you are low. So tell us about that. Yeah, uh, so I'm currently getting my master's uh, in gender studies uh, at an university in Sweden. Um, and uh, what I'm especially uh, interested in is trans studies uh, and sort of intersectional ways of looking at gender in general. Uh, so for my thesis, I'm writing about uh, non-binary people uh, and having an intersectional lens on that. Uh, so that's why I'm, if you've read any of my writings on my blog about ASWAF, um, you'll probably have seen me referencing a lot of like Butler, Striker, Ahmed, they, 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 they come back. <laughs> yes, uh, they do. They do. Um, and that's because I'm really interested in that subject. Um, that is awesome. Yeah, and, and actually, Lo, one of the reasons that I love having you on, I mean, we're friends, so obviously that's one reason. Uh, but another reason is that we both are in the academic fields, and we want to kind of apply what we're learning in classes and during papers, um, and, you know, what kind of conversations we have with our professors, we want to apply that to uh, Western fantasy. And so I think that we, specifically a Song of Ice and Fire, so um, I think that you know, we're two halves of a whole put us together and we've got a lot of really um, similar interests. And you actually approached me about this topic. And I remember you specifically said, let's look at Lysona Omar through, I believe it was an Orientalist queer feminist lens. I was like, say no more, Lo, I am in. Because uh, you knew that I was working on my project of uh, Orientalism and historic material. So I was back reading Saeed, you know, it had been a couple of years. Um, and I never lose interest in talking about Orientalism, but I also love um, feminist analysis, which is why I'm getting the, the um, you know, graduate feminist emphasis during my studies right now. Uh, and uh, I read a lot of queer scholars, but I haven't yet really gotten to apply that necessarily to A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, so maybe something we could talk about is what kind of what about Lysona Mars like kind of jumped out at us as being a good character to do this character study of because I just finished the character study of Cersei and we talked a little bit about queer and her sexuality you know um with Taina um I believe Meriwether yeah because she married Meriwether yeah so we talked a little bit about that but this is getting into this kind of ideas of gender nonconformity, which is the first time that I uh wrote about it and you mostly luckily did the part about uh gender nonconformity. so so what about Lysan Omar jumped out at us when we were when we were talking about this subject yeah I think the the quote you read uh, both by the quotes by with Griff and with Ariane both really um, make it clear that these people see him as a non-conforming -conform pe person. They think he's womanly. They uh, uh, mistake him for a woman at first, um, and that to me that's very very clear that you can look at gender and gender nonconformity in this instance. Um, I think sometimes when you talk about fantasy or like historical fiction, people are like, oh, but trans people didn't exist back then. So you can't talk about trans people, um, which is incorrect. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because uh, sure, the term trans didn't exist until like the 19th century, but um, people who have broke like transgressed boundaries of gender have always existed. Yes. Um, and uh, I wrote about that, for instance, uh, recently when I wrote an essay about uh, Brienne of Tarth and comparing her to Joan of Arc. Yes, um, I was hoping you mentioned that. That's one of my favorite of yours. Oh, thank you. Yeah, because uh, like Joan of Arc is a clear example of that because uh, she dressed in man's clothing uh, and ended up being burnt at the stake for it, essentially, because yes. the church was like, yeah, no, you can't, you can't dress like a man. That's not okay. And she was like, but I kind of wanna. 
uh, and then uh, they end up burning her. Essentially, it's a bit yes. more complicated. But and I think also your uh, essay on um, Olaris slash Sorella is also very um, can also be uh, relevant here too because one of the things I like is that I've never heard someone I've always heard discussions of Sorella slash Olaris say that oh well and they use the she pronoun oh well she just dresses as a man just like you know brave Danny Flint did in order to do what she wanted to do but kind of like I'm gonna riff off of that what you did with the, uh, when I talk about Danny Flint and then you said is it isn't it reductive to just assume that women dressing like men to enter a male sphere just makes them a woman that's wanting wanting opportunities what if they are trans what if they are non-binary and whew, blew my mind I love that essay that's actually like probably my favorite you've done and then the Brienne one is the second <laughs> um but there is this idea right that people that transcend boundaries right should we maybe we should be using they them pronouns for Alara slash Sorella like I really like kind of thinking about how we do kind of reduce things to just like kind of the the Hua Mulan thing where well she wanted to protect her family or she wanted to learn at the Citadel or she wanted to protect the realm up at the Night's Watch right so that's they just had to put on pants in order to do that right but we don't know what was in Danny's mind. We don't know what's in Sorella slash Alaris's mind. Um, so I think that, you know, it, it is a little reductive. I see a lot of times when people are discussing these characters and that it's kind of, it, it, it's like you're, e you're either, and I'm sure you talk about this a lot in trans studies, but you're either, you know, a man dressing as a woman or a woman dressing as a man rather than embodying a different type of category altogether. Yeah, and I, that reminds me of something you said uh, in your video with Ro Ro <laughs> with Rohan, our friend, uh, and you were talking about the yes and thing. Yeah. Uh, because I think that that's very relevant when talking about, for instance, uh, Sorella Laris. Uh, like, yes, they might want to study at the Citadel and they might be trans uh, yes. or non-binary. Uh, like I, I wouldn't want to use that sort of term because that's not what they would use to describe themselves. But like, they they could identify as a gender that's not female. Um, and same with uh, Brave Dana Flint. I know uh, Sam, uh, who I follow on Twitter, is going to write an essay about Brave Dana Flint from a trans perspective soon, and I'm super hyped about that. Uh, <laughs> that's very exciting. Um, so yeah, Sam's but getting I, all sorts of shout outs on this channel because uh, yeah, Rohan Sam, talked about them as well. So yeah, he's amazing. He's great. Uh, I'm so excited for that. Um, but yeah, like what you said about like reducing someone to like just a man dressing up as a woman or just blah, blah, blah. Um, that's something I talked about in, uh, in the Larry's essay and referenced, uh, Leslie Feinberg, who's, who was, um, trans activist and writer who talked about this when writing about trans people from a historical perspective. Uh, and uh, Zier said that uh, why uh, you can't just re reduce my existence to uh, and my identity to oppression. Uh, for instance, like when talking about uh, someone who was assigned female at birth uh, dressing in men's clothing to get into an educational institution like yeah. you can't just just don't just uh, reduce my existence and my identity to oppression it's not just that uh, and um, yeah I, that that's something when I reread that passage when reading that book for that essay that that is like really stuck with me um, and I think that's um, appropriate to contemporary debates as well. Um, you can't just reduce something to uh, to oppression. Yes, so, and like, also the Sphinx too, right? We kind of, you kind of talked about that a little bit in, in the Alara Sorella essay, where the, the Sphinx is also kind of, it's, it's transcends gender. And yet people are like, there's a male Sphinx or there's a female Sphinx. It's like, that's not, you're missing the point of the Sphinx. And I'm actually going to have a Sphinx at, at some point in 2021. <laughs> I already have like five uh, Aswaf essays prepared or ready uh, a plan for the first like three months of this year. I need to, or next year, I need to like chill. But I do want to talk a little bit about um, the Sphinx in one of my essays, because I was really inspired by your essay and that you kind of showed that 
um, the Sphinx is often kind of misinterpreted um, and, and Olaris slash Sorella, right? The Sphinx is not, is the riddle, not the riddler. You know, there's this, a lot of people just kind of go, well, I don't know what Martin's up to. I'm just going to skedaddle. And, and they, if, it's like, if it's not about prophecy of the end game, then I think that people kind of think that it's just a one-off or it doesn't mean anything. But I mean, just because he's an old white dude, cis hetero from New Jersey, doesn't mean that he can't be doing something with gender when it comes to the Sphinx, right? Like, I, I just don't want to, I, I, I don't want to be like, he's a writing god, he, he's thought of everything, but he's obviously, do, why would he, any other character he could have put the Sphinx with? Why did he pick the one character that is liminal, right? And we talk about liminality a lot in this, um, and transgressive, right? These kinds of words that we use in our essay, which is huge in queer theory, which is basically someone that is outside of the, the hetero gender binary that we as a society apparently can't freaking give up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, uh, that's something that Susan Stryker, who's like a foundational person in trans theory, uh, writes a lot about. Um, and she's also the person who writes about the Sphinx that I'm referencing in the Laris essay because I freaking love Susan Stryker. Um, and yeah, she writes about that a lot, about like how as a trans person, you have to, uh, like, you can't just ignore the boundaries. You have, you like, you're constantly aware that this, that there's the female boundary and the male boundary, and you can move between them, but people are going to think you're weird and possibly attack you in some way uh, yeah. and harass you. So either you try to, like, squeeze yourself into the very tight box of gender and sex that's allowed according to society or you live outside of it and face the consequences of that um, yeah and i think that also um especially american society has i think we kind of kid ourselves that because rupaul's drag race is on tv you know that that we've gotten better and and i'm not doubting rupaul's like i love watching that but it, it is like it's a very you, you really put they put transness in like a very certain digestible little you know little square and we we know and i'm sure lo can speak to this even more um we know that um trans uh people especially trans people of color are much more likely to uh just statistically to uh to be uh, to meet be met with violence um and you know we have uh many you know there was a hero of the of the stonewall riots and i'm so sorry her name is escaping me but she was a uh, a trans Marsha woman P. Of Johnson. Color. Yes, Marsha Johnson writes. Then that that a lot of people talk about that, but there it's still happening to this day, and it was happening before her that um you know that people um who transgress these boundaries um are are you know um violence is is like you we we said in the essay um and very very important to say is that you know violence against them is justified because they transgress these boundaries, and that makes cis hetero people I'm not saying all of you guys all of them are the same like I am cis but I am not hetero but I'm not saying all cis hetero people are the same but it generally it generally generally it will make people uncomfortable and not everyone then would lash out violently but you know um just a simple thing as making a joke or or kind of laughing at it you know is actually um you know uh devaluing their existence or not even recognizing it in the first place yeah exactly and that um the article that i uh, put reference a slight bit in the essay about uh by talia may betcher talks a lot about that um and uh and uh, they write about how trans people are either you you're often forced to make a choice between uh like blending in and pretending you're not trans and then if someone finds out you're trans then they feel like you've been lying to them and tricking them. And then that can be used as an excuse for violence. That often, yes. that that's something that happens to trans women a lot of the time, for instance, by yeah. straight cis men who feel like their masculinity is threatened by them possibly being attracted to a trans woman. Or if you're open with it from the start, then you risk violence because people are bigots. Um, yeah, lose-lose situation. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's depressing. 
yeah, it is very, let's not, let's not be too depressed, but it is very depressing. Um, but okay, so let's, uh, we can obviously go back to any of these and, and extend beyond these issues, but let's kind of, um, we, we basically what we, I, at least I think what we were trying to do with this essay is kind of theorize Lyson Omar and kind of um, use these tools that we've been given by uh, queer and trans and feminist and scholars and, you know, many of them are multiple at once. Uh, so all, all these kind of these kinds of approaches of theory, we were trying to kind of see how Lysonomar kind of fits within um, th these ideas. And so I think that going back to kind of the quotes we, we quoted in um, the essay, I think the one from Ariane is of particular note because like we note in the essay, um, Ariane is often celebrated in the fandom because she is uh, out there with her sexuality. Um, but at the same time, you ha this, this passage in particular, and I think it, it was someone on Twitter, and I'm so sorry, I, I can't remember who it was, but there was someone on Twitter who, who what, I just quoted this and I said, hey, this is an upcoming quote um, for our essay, um, and please follow Lo on Twitter and me, please. We have some awesome things going on. Um, but uh, so uh, they had um, uh, commented that, you know, it's kind of interesting that Ariane you know, we, we kind of were like, oh yeah, she's with it and everything and kind of, and then she's like just totally dismissive of Mar um, completely. And he automatically thinks she's gonna mention him looking like a woman, right? She goes, oh, you look like, and he goes, a woman. He's like, I heard it before, right? And she goes, oh, a Targaryen, which is like, she could have, she's kind of thinking both, right? And he points that out when he says, oh, I've heard that the women of House Targaryen, right? Are, uh, we're, we're very beautiful, right? So he knows that, she, she probably was mentioning his Targ looks, you know, his Valyrian looks, but also, and yes, and um, his femininity was of note to her and it kind of, it floored her. She was very surprised. Um, the only other comment we get is that he was good from her POV is that he was good at speaking the common tongue. So it's like, dude looks like a lady and speaks the common tongue well, is like what we get from Ariane, And that's extremely reductive, um, you know, and it's both what we, we talked about in the essay it comments on him being a lonely character and it comments on him being exoticized, orientalized, right? Other, cause he's Lyseni. So it's like both at the same time. So I, when I saw that quote, I was like, ah, this essay writes itself. <laughs> um, but yeah, what, what, what do we see going on in that quote? I think like what we see is uh, a super clear example of microaggressions. Uh, and because as you mentioned, like the, Sometimes the violence that uh, people who don't conform to norms meet uh, is not like physical violence, but sometimes it's microaggressions. And microaggressions, that that as a word is sometimes misunderstood. It's not meant as like micro as in small things that don't hurt you. <laughs> it's meant as micro on the micro level instead of the macro level of society. So like micro as in between individuals. So like when she says that thing about, oh, you look like a dot 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 yeah uh that's a, that's a thing that i think a lot of non gender non-conforming people can relate to um and that like you uh you go into the doctor's office and they refer to you as miss or they uh you um you i don't know you have to fill out a form and there's all 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 just man or woman or you have you have an old id that states that you're uh, a sex that you don't identify as like there's these constant things that people misgender you they look at you strangely it's like a double take or uh, those those f like small things that makes you feel like oh i don't belong here i don't fit in uh I, I often describe it as like a chafing sort of you feel like your skin is not it's there's something like underneath your skin moving it's like I don't I don't feel comfortable yeah. um and I think that's and these, clear small, these seemingly that. small things build up too yeah you, know? you don't need to be punched in the face and, and you know called a queer <laughs> you know to you know like it, it these things kind of do build up and mm -hmm. uh they do obviously you know, a lot of, of, of trans people, and I have a couple of friends who are trans that say that it's like, you know, you eventually kind of internalize a lot of this stuff. And you do kind of say, okay, maybe there is something wrong with me, even though you feel right when you are presenting yourself as the gender that you mm -hmm. identify as. Um, and 
I forgot the pl this plug at the beginning. Lo is going to be on the Unspun Yarn for the second episode of Bleep the Patriarchy, along with Ian Thomas Malone, and we're going to be talking about transphobia. So please uh, tune in. That is uh, December 30th. We still don't have a, a time yet, but if you um, if you subscribe to Unspun Yarn and hit that beautiful little bell, then you'll know when we're going live. And if you follow me on Twitter, trust me, you're going to know about it because I plug the crap out of anything that me or my friends are going to be on. So please check that out. So if you want to see more of, God, I can never point the right way, more of Lo um, talking about this, then definitely check that out on December 30th. Because um, I know they have a lot of opinions about this. And this is just scratching the surface um, of what we want to talk about. And we're obviously trying to talk about this kind of as it applies to Lysonomar, but in that episode of Bleep the Patriarchy is going to be about our contemporary world. So that's going to be very important. Um, but yeah, 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 you're right. And the, the kind of assumption that she kind of has of wanting to wanting to misgender him, right? She kind of is starting to uh, go into that. Um, and I think also the constant uh, kind of wonder of like, how can this guy be a part of a sellsword company is very degrading, right? It's seen as you are inhabiting a kind of liminal leaning feminine space and therefore you cannot inhabit this masculine space of being in a sellsword company. And young Griff, I think also um, in A Dance with Dragons thinks about like, this guy uh, is too cautious, right? You know, and it's like, he's the, <laughs> he's the spy master. He's supposed to be strategic, but that scene is weak and feminine to hesitate, right? When it's actually yeah. being smart and calculating, right? So what you're just supposed, they're just supposed to, you know, land in Westeros and just go at it, right? With no plan. And we also see, and this is my opinion, um, but we also see that they go to like Griffin's Roost and everything like this is kind of a vanity project for, for John Connington too. Their strategy is basically, but I want Griffin's Roost back because this is my ancestral homeland. Like it's not, <laughs> like they could use some of Lysoto Bar uh, speaking up a little more on the strategy because Yes, Storm's End is important because, you know, Seed of House Baratheon, but, you know, was Griffin's Roost the, really the place to go? You know, it, it just, yeah, I, it doesn't feel strategic to me. I'm not like the best person to talk about military strategy, <laughs> but I suppose they needed like some small footholds. But yeah, yeah I mean, Griff is very, he's very like, I need to revenge my love my big love and i mean sure but yeah he's <laughs> yeah. gonna mess up uh yeah. sooner or later yeah um yeah maybe one day we can also talk a little bit more about john connington and his uh love of Rhaegar. that that would be very fascinating to talk about um yeah because i also think that you know there have been some great um queer people in the fandom that have talked about that um but i i do think that it it tends to be also reduced just like Cersei's sexuality is is reduced as well um mm. but yeah so I think also the constant um it's almost like a uh when talking about that he paints his nails and wears the jewels like we hear that every single time he's introduced mm -hmm. so we're seeing what the POV character is focusing on right so you know we hear from Griff that he has painted nails and jewelry. It's like, we don't really necessarily have to hear that again, but Ariane sees it for the first time and we hear it again because that is what she is, you know, that's what catches her eye. Um, and yeah. we don't like, is he tall? <laughs> is he short? Is he fat? Is he skinny? We don't know. Cause all we know is that he's got nails painted, Targaryen features and he has jewelry on. Like we- yeah we you know the way that so many other you know characters that fit in the binary are introduced we learn a lot we learn about different features you know we don't like we will like kind of learn about their clothes and everything but like what was he wearing i don't know i just know that he had he could have been naked with painted nails and jewelry for all i know <laughs> i think she would have noticed that but you know what i'm saying yeah. is like we get these laser focused pov kind of descriptions of lyson omar yeah, and I think that's uh, something that's interesting with the whole, like, the way the story is written from the, like, limited point of view, that you get what the character is focused on. Um, and uh, in that way, you get, like, what they think is weird or what they think is, 
like worthy of attention and by getting what they focus on you can sort of tell what society would focus on um yeah. because if both griff and ariane think this is odd then you then it's kind of clear that oh society would also think in general would also think this is odd yes definitely yeah and which is why i think that our point in the essay which um you helped make so eloquently is that you know we should then kind of really look at a song of ice and fire with a little bit more of a contemporary lens we shouldn't do what um i think is kind of the knee-jerk reaction which is it's basically the middle ages so throw up our hands and be like oh we can't talk about contemporary issues um i i I've made it very clear on my channel um, that I think that George R. R. Martin is a contemporary man and there and writes contemporary issues into his books. And uh, I think it's it, it's not doing the full breadth of literary analysis to just look at it as if it were the Middle Ages. And it's not. It's inspired by how he thinks the Middle Ages was, right? Like it's written in its own timeline of like what 297 AC or whatever we're in right now. Um, it's it's yeah. based on when Aegon, uh, the conqueror, you know, came to Westeros uh, off of Dragonstone. So it's you know they're they're it's it's inspired, but it isn't just medieval. And you know Shiloh, obviously, who wrote the book on medievalism in um, Song of Ice and Fire, and who has a, a degree in medievalism, can obviously talk about that much more than I can. Or medieval studies. Um, so please definitely check out um, Shiloh Carroll on on Twitter. Um, but and her book as well <laughs> uh, because she, yeah. she knows what she's talking about when it comes to that but I she and I really see eye to eye on this which is um, that you know uh, it's important to look at the medievalism and all of that in Song of Ice and Fire but we can't forget that this is written like I said by like a cis hetero white dude from New Jersey who uh, who protested against the Vietnam War so yeah. to be like he doesn't you know Think about contemporary issues when he's writing this it's is i think uh once again reductive which is a cute word i'm gonna use this whole apparently this whole video yeah and i think like uh i remember when i first read shiloh's book and she mentioned that thing that uh, george had said that he thinks that uh, people in the middle ages essentially thought about love sex and sexual sexuality the same way as we do and that's just wrong <laughs> that's incorrect we have uh, the way that humans have conceptualized sexuality is drastically different uh, now from the middle ages uh, just like a small example of that uh, is um, that before like the 19th century or so uh, you didn't see sexuality as an identity you saw it as a practice uh, and this is something that Michel Foucault has written a lot about um, but like, for instance, homosexuality wasn't seen as like, you weren't a homosexual, you were a person who did homosexual acts that was, that were punishable by law and were sinful. Yeah. Uh, but it's not like you were a person that were homosexual. Um, and similarly, like I mentioned, we have had loads of different ways of understanding sex and gender throughout history and throughout the world still throughout the world there are a lot of different ways of conceptualizing that uh so you just you can't say that it's the same yes. um yeah so and, and, i mean perhaps like one of the easiest things to say is we have birth control <laughs> like when you were as a as you know someone who was uh born a woman and was treated like a woman back then anytime you and your husband would have sex, you would think we, I could be pregnant after tonight. Like yeah. that's not the case anymore. So this, we're divorcing, natal, natalist ideas were the same as having sex. And now those are separate. You, I mean, unless you're not doing things right, you can, <laughs> right, no exact, go, okay, I'm going to now try, we're gonna try for a baby, right? Or like me, never want one in the first place and be on birth control your whole life. Like there are options. Um, yeah. And that was not the case back then. So just just the sheer act of sex and the consequences of sex are not the same now. So why would we think the views of sex and sexuality would be the same? Um, yeah. So this goes back to you know my my comment is that like dude, it's it's an old dude from New Jersey. <laughs> like we can't you know think that like you can definitely be liberal and you can definitely be forward thinking and be older. 
Um, but you also are going to have your limits. And I have my limits right now as a young person. So, and you know, yeah. in 20 years, there will probably be something I'll be like, I don't get that. <laughs> but just because you don't get it doesn't mean that it's wrong or sinful or bad. Right. Yeah. And I think like, to not be that too harsh on George, I think it puts in a lot of interesting ideas about sex and gender. Like I've written how many essays at this point about this? Like Brianne, uh, for instance, I think is super fascinating from a gender perspective. Uh, And I think that even if like George obviously hasn't read the same theories that I have, but he's still putting a lot of those things into the story and some some parts of it is very like explicit that it's about gender Um, so it's not it's just that it's not accurate to the medieval times in a lot of ways um so yes we're definitely going to come back to this idea of um trans issues definitely um but i also kind of wanted to talk about liminality in the case of being uh foreign right so we have liminality obviously you don't fit into, you know, you're, you're outside of kind of the sliding scale of binary that we're, that, you know, it's kind of um, thought of when it comes to the heterosexual binary, but you also have the Westerosi space and the SOC space and the SOC space being thought of as liminal because all of our POVs are Westerosi. And then Danny might, then I talk about this in the episode I did with, on uh, Through the Moon Door about, uh, Danny and Essos, which is that she is in Essos, but her th- way of thinking, kind of her uh, her upbringing and all of that, listening to Viserys and all of that, is Westerosi. She thinks of herself as Westerosi, and so we don't get any Essos POV. And in that way, they're extra exoticized, extra orientalized. Um, and so, like, what do we just looking at Lise and Lysonomar coming from Lise? How how do we see that kind of working in within? this kind of idea of liminality and queerness. Yeah, I mean, uh, Liz Liz is so exoticized and sexualized. And I mean, I don't know Orientalism as well as you do, but I've read some of it. And that's something that that was part of the reason I was like, oh my God, I got to talk to Amy about this. (laughs) Because uh, this was partly inspired by me listening to Girls Gone Canon's uh, Patreon episode about Liz. And they mentioned then, yeah, they talked about Liz and I was like, oh my God, it's so Oriental. Oh my God. Um, So yeah, like you mentioned, like Steve has written, uh, people from the Orient, is often are often seen as more exotic sexual uh, etc and Lys is a city of splendor of uh, sex, sex I mean there's sex workers they and they are also sex slaves uh, yeah. and yeah it's just very sexualized and very like exotic in a lot of ways yeah and I think something that's interesting too about Lys specifically is we get this idea that they um that the the sex slaves there cater to any type of sexual appetite so that makes you think that anyone wanting any type of transgressive sex can go to lease and and find i hate to use the word services services for that um so there's also this idea of uh any type of queer sexuality and such has a place in lease it seems Mm. It, it would probably still be you know looked down upon um but and i believe uh, Varys what is, was either born in Lise or grew or was sold to someone in Lise. I can't remember, but he, is he from Mir? And then was, I don't remember. I'm sorry, but I, I thought that also Varys might have had some. Now, I think he's from Lise, but now yeah. I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, I know. I thought it was from Lise and then sold to Mir or, some, or the other way yeah. around. I think you're right. He might be from Lise. But um, yeah, we see a lot of these characters that are kind of outside of the boundaries of normativity kind of being associated mm. with Lise. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that's very interesting with Varys in particular, because he very much fits into this sort of Greek, ancient Greek idea of the eunuch, uh, which was often uh, associated with like Persia or more Eastern places, uh, because for a lot of the time in Greece, you weren't allowed to make 
um, well, in Greece and in ancient Rome, you weren't allowed to make eunuchs in the country, but you could import them. <laughs> Uh, so they were often quite literally from the East. Uh, mm. And so they were associated with both this uh, liminality with ethnicity and geography and with gender. Um, so I think that's something that plays into both Varis and Lysan Omar, that they, they both have this moving from us, moving from one starting place to another in geography and with gender. Um, yeah like the, the broadest possible definition of trans is moving moving from an unchosen starting place to another place or moving not having a finished starting finishing place but moving somewhere um so there's yeah there's this transgressiveness with both gender and ethnicity with both Varis and Lysa Amar yeah and I I talked about that in the essay you know, um, applying it to what I know best, which is um, Chinese culture, where you have the eunuchs um, were kind of overseers of the concubines. They were allowed to enter and there's it, literally the language in Chinese is the inner quarters is where the women are. And then the outside is where it was the realms of men. So the in, inside was seen as the feminine realm and the outside, you know, men would go to work, they would socialize, they would be in politics, right? This was the outside world, whereas women would be, um, you know, at home, they would do the sexual labor, um, they would uh, do the labors such as weaving and all of that, that was all done inside. Um, and so you had, the eunuch was able to transgress, right, to trans, to move, right, as in like, you know, transportation, right, to move in between, uh, back and forth, if you will. So he would, so he is able to go from the emperor to the, to the concubines and then back. And this is why um, in Chinese culture, the eunuchs were treated with such suspicion because they were constantly thought of as scheming with one of his concubines or with the empress or something like that, you know, to overthrow the emperor or to, um, to kind of uh, go against his will for who is the crown prince to try and like poison the crown prince so that one concubine's, you know, son will then be the crown prince, this kind of stuff. So I think that it's very similar and you're ta you talking about the, the Greek kind of um, uh, case and then the Chinese case is that even though there are obvious cultural differences and historical differences, you still have this kind of suspicion of a man who, who is, appears to be a man, but according to you know, normativity, he is not fully a man. He is kind of uh, outside. He transcends what we think of as a man. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that becomes so obvious with various because um, I go into that in, in, in length in my essay about various, but there's so many times people reference, talk about him as like not a true man or uh, whatever, because he lacks certain body parts. Um, and they view him with suspicion, partly because he's a eunuch, partly because he's a foreigner, and partly just because he's the master whispers and who knows when he'll be watching you. Yeah. Um, and I think that's very interesting with the Masters of Whispers in general, because uh, like we noted in the essay, uh, a lot of them are outsiders in some way. There's Varys, there's Lysan Omar, there's Blood Raven, who's, I mean, he's Westerosi, but he was looked upon with very much suspicion, both for like his magical things, but also just because of his looks uh, and his later his disability. Yeah. Uh, so and it's also like, he was a part of Targaryens, but also kind of a Blackwood. Yeah. Like it, it, he even his identity as far as a house was was odd yeah. because you know, for example, like you know, with Catelyn when she marries Ned, she's a Stark, even though she's also a Tully. Like, but she's mm. she's a Stark, right? And her kids are Starks, right? But you have this. He's also um, uh, I, I hate to use the B word. He's also a bastard. <laughs> So you also have that idea of uh, you were born outside of a sanctioned marriage, right? Mm. So once again, being a liminal character as well. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, uh, like Masaria, uh, the white worm, uh, who was foreign and also, I believe, a sex worker. Uh, well, a sexual transgressor in some ways, at least. Um so these masters of whispers have to be people who 
aren't you can like disavow them if they mess up essentially uh, yeah and it's also, kind of like you have them do the dirty work because you yeah. don't want you know respectable people dirtying their hands exactly exactly um and also maybe they do have a more like talent of moving between different spaces because if you're um a marginalized person you often have to learn how to navigate different spaces in different ways um maybe i don't know but that's just me speculating but maybe uh they do know some of the like back alleys of uh the cities better yeah and i think your your uh point in the essay um and for those of you that well, I'll just give a little behind the scenes about our writing process. It's kind of, it's basically half low, half me, and then we kind of synthesize it together. But what I love is the line that you wrote. First of all, I love the line that you wrote about how, uh, you know, saying that men and women are biologically different has been used to oppress women. Like, thank you. Bow, 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 mm -hmm. Feminism. Anyway, <laughs> so I love that. Uh, and I also love your line about being, working within the shadows. So maybe we yeah. can look at how the Master of Whispers and particularly Varys and Lysone Omar, because I think there are so many parallels going on between them, how them, you know, working in the shadows is similar to, um, to kind of trans experience and, and kind of this compromising that you constantly have to do with the binary. Yeah, exactly. Um, and sort of like I mentioned before, a lot of like the trans experience is having to constantly uh, and like, just to be clear to people who are not familiar with me, I am trans myself um, and I study uh, trans things. So that's where I'm coming from with this. Um, but a lot of the trans experience is having to constantly like negotiate how to present yourself to others and that's not sometimes people see that as trans people like being dishonest or sneaky or whatever mm -hmm. but it's off like from a as a trans person myself i can say that it's usually just okay how safe am i in this environment how much crap am i willing to put up with um like myself i'm non-binary uh, people don't look at me and think I'm non-binary. So often I used to need, like in new situations or whenever I used to have to be like, okay, is it worth it bringing it up at this time? Um, so you learn how to navigate those situations um, and move, with, move in the shadows. Uh, and I think that's an experience a lot of queer people and a lot of marginalized people in general have uh, that you learn how to navigate the shadows and you learn how to navigate the bright spaces where you're not technically allowed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where people will look with you at you with suspicion if you move in those spaces because what what is that weird person doing? Yeah, there? we can think they of the bright spaces as like a spotlight that's put on people that are queer and different, right? Um, yeah. And I think what I what I really got out of that line about the shadows low and what I've been thinking about is how master of whispers you know people that don't conform working in the shadows to normative norm normies I don't know how to put it people that are that fit in the normative uh um space see that as suspicious like why are they being so sneaky whereas the people that are in the shadows that is for their protection the shadows mm. is a protective space and it might you know, look dishonest or appear suspicious to other, you know, to the outside, but that's actually where they can comfortably, you know, be themselves and kind of perform their duties and, and do what they need to do. And so I find that so fascinating that the shadow, we think dark, you know, evil, shady, literally, mm -hmm. um, but then those that are working within it, that is actually warm and protective for them. And this is something I'm going to talk about in my essay about yin and yang, also known as yin and yang, um, for those that don't speak Chinese, but yin and yang, um, is that a lot of Westerners um, misunderstand it as uh, two equal things that need to be balanced when the yang, the male, the light is above the female, the dark, the shady, right? The sun is more than the moon. So they do need to be in balance, but there is a hierarchy. And this is very similar to we can celebrate queerness and celebrate transness, but there is a hierarchy still of mm -hmm. the, nor of, you know, it's still the default to be cis hetero. So is that not elevating it above queerness? 
right? There's still mm -hmm. a hierarchy. So we have the light being better than the shadows and the shadows existing and being necessary, right? You need the master of whispers you know, it's, it's a, like, like we say in the essay, it's a necessary role for, it's basically like the CIA <laughs> of Westeros. It needs to be there, but everyone's like making conspiracy know. theories Does about it, it and everything. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Everyone's super suspicious thinking that they've got their, you know, fingers in everyone's pies. And yeah, definitely Varys is up to a lot of stuff. We know that he's um, supporting young Griff and all of this, but he also gets blamed for a lot of things that are not his fault yeah uh and what you said there about like the lightness and the darkness and the necessity of it while something being devalued really reminds me of what uh Judith butler writes um about the zone of the abject and i'm try i'm gonna try to explain this simply Judith butler is not the easiest person to understood oh understand. boy is she not yeah i have, um, uh, yeah i've read uh her i've read two of her books three times and I still can't explain to you a lot of her concepts. Yeah, but essentially the point uh, that I'm trying, that I think is relevant here is that uh, she or they, they, they use both pronouns, uh, they use, they, um, uh, they argue that uh, in order to have coherent gender, like the normative gender that that which makes sense you have to have the weird the queer gender yeah. uh, that gender which fits into the zone of the abject um so you have to have something that is like that's weird that doesn't fit to know what fits norm, it's sort of like right? the us and them uh, yes. thing you, you have to the same thing with good and evil you can't you know yeah. you don't have um you know if you want to do the greek mythology right you don't have zeus and the gods without hades and the underworld right exactly. and like i said earlier still a hierarchy you say oh yeah. yeah we need the bad thing but no one likes the bad thing right we yeah. follow the heroes and the stories um so it, it it's still a hierarchy even though we begrudgingly acknowledge that we need the queer, the shadows, the, the mm. you know, the, the shady. Um, yeah. And I just think that I find that fascinating because if it's so necessary, it, it, it's very necessary and yet it's not celebrated like other necessary mm. things are. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, also I feel like you should mention uh, Butler gets the, the term the abject from Yulia Kristeva, uh, if you know who that is. Uh, French feminist um, talks a lot about how women are the abject in society. Very interesting. Um, yeah, you don't have the big, strong, you know, male stereotype without the the weak and genteel female stereotype. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, you always have to have something to compare it right to elevate and to compare it to um, mm. in order for it to exist. So you know, straight people, you get to exist and be awesome and special because we queer people are here. So you're welcome. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um yeah and i think i mean you see that a lot like throughout the story there is always these comparisons between um like the the may, men and women uh queer people non-queer people uh able-bodied people uh disabled people uh like we mentioned Tyrion, for instance who's constantly seen as a half man because yes. of his disability uh, and not as like a proper manly man or whatever um, because he his body functions differently than the norm and because he's uh, he's born as a man he was assigned male at birth uh, people expect like okay men they have to be super strong and able and be able to fight all the things uh, and because his body limits limits his ability to do that, he's seen as a Hoffman. Yes, um, so this is highlighted further with Jamie embodying mm, that very uh, symbol or very image of that type of man. And then when Jamie loses his hand, it becomes golden hand of the just, right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, when he loses his hand, he starts to think of himself as less than, right? Exactly. Uh, so... But like as the story tells us, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't uh, devalue those people and we shouldn't underestimate those people because Tyrion gets up to a lot of things and has quite a lot of impact despite him not being as physically strong as Jaime. 
Yeah. Um, and obviously we think brand is probably going to have quite a lot of impact Just despite <laughs> uh, despite having some physical limitations because he, his mental and spiritual capabilities are uh, so strong. Yeah, and you so, can also see this with the Green Seer and kind of something that I talked about in my Dark Star essay with my friend uh, Julie, my first ever collab essay. We talk about kind of the, the sword and the shield and that mm. there are often people that are directing things like like uh, Duran or like Brand, uh, Bran when he's in the Weirwood. He's kind of, kind of overseeing things. And then you have the people who go out and actually do the things like Jon Snow or... Um, for Duran Martell, it would have been Oberyn, right? But that doesn't, we often tell stories about Oberyn and Jon Snow and oh, look at that, they're out doing the things. And we put that above the people that are planning and making it happen and doing the kind of um, the, the, the work to make, make this, to prop up these heroes, right? Mm. So it's, it's very common to, I think, value what is more visible and what we can see as being more masculine and out there and interacting. So like you see, we'll go back to Lysona Mar, you look at the men in the Soul Sword Company that are gonna that go out there and they take Griffin's Roost, they're gonna march on Storm's End. But like Son Omar sitting and, you know, kind of being the schemer, they need each other. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. And yet his job is seen as whatever, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's, that's the patriarchy for you. <laughs> ah, fucking patriarchy yeah bleep that patriarchy bleep it y'all anyway Mm -hmm. (laughs) um yeah no that is it is exactly like that um which is why uh and i talk about this a lot and i'll continue to talk about it i love aria and i love brian but they are masculinized and they are seen as going out there and doing the thing with the with the you know her uh you know and aria because she is kind of this assassin figure is kind of working in the shadows and yet also mm. is elevated as this kind of masculine figure but so we'll just stick with Brienne and she goes out there she does the things right she is really um for good reason she is really um seen as one you know a great character within the fandom everyone uh, you know I don't know anyone who doesn't like Brienne um but at the same time she's a strong woman because she is doing the masculine things and then you see how people talk about Sansa and it's not the same even though she is uh, strong and she's becoming much smarter in the veil, she's really learning how to play the Game of Thrones. And we know from the show, and hopefully we'll get a better version in the books, that she actually is able to um, be a good, be a player and she's able to, to come up with plans and hopefully fight for Northern independence and make the North strong. Um, and this is not through martial thing, but, you know, martial means, but through diplomacy and through, um, you know, I don't want to say scheming because that has kind of a negative connotation, but through planning, right? And so once mm. again, we see Brienne elevated as this, and once again, I love Brienne, I'm not crapping on her, but she is elevated as this really awesome, cool character. Yeah, feminism, fighting for women, but she's doing all the masculine things. And that's why it's very easy to, to like her and put her in the good, awesome category. Whereas Sansa is, is developing with more feminine uh, virtues and more feminine strengths. And I think that is where um, a lot of people in the fandom, I think, fail to see how important that also is. So Var- what Var- Varys and Lysona Mar are doing is also uh, important, just as, you know, armies are important, uh, just as important as the armies that are going to go out and conquer. Yeah, and I think I made a similar point, sort of, uh, in my first essay about Brienne and Arya, about how they clearly affected by the patriarchy in a lot of ways but it's in different ways than Sansa for instance uh, so Sansa is uh, yeah oppressed by the patriarchy she's literally beaten by Joffrey on a daily basis essentially when she's in the Red Keep um, uh, but she also fits the mold of a woman and therefore has some like privileges in a way because she fits gender norms but also she fits the gender norm of a woman and is therefore oppressed and devalued in society while Brienne and Arya they are physically strong and can protect themselves physically in other ways and are especially by the fandom <laughs> valued a lot because they're masculine and cool and strong women Woo! Um, while 
like in the story they're very much uh yeah harassed put through violence uh because they don't conform to gender gender norms so i think like you say that's interesting and there's something there about like the cool strong woman tomboy archetype yeah. in the media as well definitely uh, well while like the opposite with lights on Omar uh, is not at all valued yes um, yeah and I think that you know we can see lights on Omar as a strong uh character and especially after doing this project I think that I hope especially because I think he's an interesting character I hope that he can even when young Griff is defeated I hope that he finds a way to survive uh and maybe either be like i'm gonna head back to lease this is too much or he's going to pick a side either danny or not not danny and um bring his his smarts to that side because i think what i like about lison omar is that we learn that he is not impulsive we learn that he does not like young griff is after a game of savas with Tyrion is like i'm going you know <laughs> it's very impulsive and I think that Lysone Omar is trying to temper that impulsivity as much as he can, you know, mm-hmm. young growth is the boss. Um, but I, th- I really find that interesting that he uh, and Varys both are these, um, these figures that plan very carefully. And because of that, you know, we should see that as a virtue. And yet someone that kind of like charges into battle all willy nilly is is kind of held up it, it seems like we have we have it a little backwards <laughs> um but that yeah. that's the that's the binary for you yeah yeah right and uh, we also talked a lot about this uh low when we um were discussing uh colonialism and orientalism and historic materials we talked a lot about I'm gonna say it right marissa coulter not ann coulter jesus why can i not get that right Marissa Coulter, how Mm -hmm. we want to be like, yeah, badass boss lady, but she is killing children. (laughs) So spoiler alert for the first season of His Dark Materials in the first book. Anyway, eh, it's been out. Come on, guys. Um, But, you know, we see it as as kind of, uh, you know, uh, we want to be like, oh, yeah, a woman going out and getting it done, right? We, we, we uh, kind of put that up as like, oh, that's great that she went from the feminine to the masculine and owned it. Whereas we have someone going from the masculine to the feminine owning it. And it's like, oh God, what a weirdo. Look at that dude that looks like a lady, <laughs> right? We get that from mm-hmm. Ariane and Griff's perspective. And that just shows the hierarchy that I will keep talking about that there is of this duality of the masculine, the feminine. The masculine yeah. is upheld. And the feminine is seen as like a step down. It's like, you got lucky. You were born, you know, a man. Why, why are you then devaluing, you know, yourself mm-hmm. by wearing nail polish which I love doing uh you know and (laughs) jewelry and all of that um and I think also something that's fascinating like I was saying is this lease and this list kind of being everywhere and I'm obsessed with like names little or little kind of syllables that kind of keep going throughout as song of ice and fire and list is one that I picked up on very quickly um so you know like I said Alyssa um Lysa uh you know all of the lists whenever you see it it's always associated with the feminine Mm -hmm. yeah yeah no that's very interesting and especially with the uh, connection with poisons there and uh, poisons being a women's weapon uh and like we said uh not something a manly man would use because a manly man would just stab someone with a sword (laughs) yeah this great phallic symbol Um, yes (laughs) while Uh, women's weapons are more like fluid and secretive and this is something that i know we're going to talk about when we talk about the poppy war so this is a little bit Mm -hmm. of a preview we're going to um write an essay and have a discussion about the feminine and specifically rejecting the feminine in the Poppy War uh, series by R.F. Kuang, please read it. But there is a um, there is a figure I'm not going to spoil. I'm going to be really careful about spoiling, but um, I call them content previews. I have this thing with my fandom friends where they're all like spoilers. I'm like, it's a content preview, but I also, <laughs> re- I also respect that people want to experience it. But anyways, this you get this in like chapter eight. It's not. It, it does become big later, but I'm going to keep it spoilers free Mm -hmm. there's a a figure called the vipress and right there are three figures two males and a a female and 
one male is like super go oh, i'm the knight i'm gonna you know kill i got my sword and he's the leader of the three and there's another dude that's like i'm super into the gods and i'm possessed by the gods magic magic and then they go to the woman and she's like i am go i am but a woman so i'm going to take on the power of poisoning and she becomes the vipress right so even there and this is obviously rf kuang uh she understands and she specifically works off of the chinese mythology uh in chinese mythology as well women were seen as working in the shadows poisoning right um so you even in that series which i am so excited to talk about with you Lo, um you also see this association of the feminine with poison and with mm -hmm. uh uncleanliness uh which is mm -hmm. that's the thing is the yin and the yang right and god i'm sorry i'm trying to keep it as short as i can about talking about yin and yang but the yang it, there is this idea in chinese medicine as well that if you have too much yin in your body too much of the feminine energy that it's bad for you and you need to balance it out with the yang right and so but too much yang in your body is like still cool you're fine <laughs> so i mean it's it, you're supposed to have balance but if you have too much of the male energy it's not as you know important to mm. balance out as if you have the feminine energy so there's this idea of the feminine energy poisoning you and being unclean um this is gonna gonna gross you out audience you shouldn't be grossed out by this it's natural menstruation is associated with uncleanliness right and so a woman is unclean especially when she menstruates um, and so there, there is this idea of, you know, the feminine energy inherently being muddy and unclean and the masculine energy being, you know, like clear water and clean. And that's, and that's your, <laughs> your crash course on um, Chinese yin and yang theory. That's so interesting. That's also extremely similar to what you like Kristeva writes about that I mentioned before. Uh, so I might have to read that book a bit more before uh our upcoming club which will <laughs> delight my thesis supervisor who's been going on about me reading that oh really <laughs> yeah yeah because i'm using uh butler and the abject and my thesis supervisor has been like oh but you need to at least read Kristeva then before because it's based on that and like okay, nice I'm gonna... There you go. And then we can apply it to a book we love and it'll, it'll make it more fun. Yeah. I, I always love to, you know, when you have the tools in your toolbox that we get from theory, mm. um, you don't just let your tools sit in the toolbox. You've got to no. use them. So, no. um, but, and uh, critical ace theory is one of those tools, that, uh, by the way, Trump, it's not some kind of crazy, you know, radical thinking. It's just another type of theory. If you would have gone to actually gone to Connie, you went to college, we don't finish it. Anyways, <laughs> not trying to okay. get into No, mm, okay. Mm. Oh, <laughs> no. Not getting into it. <laughs> but, the, but feminist and queer theory is just another tool in your toolbox, just like critical race theory is. So. Yeah, and if you believe in rational for if choice theory, like certain economists, then you should believe in using critical race theory because they're just both as made up. Yes. It's just tools. All theories to are understand. tools in the toolbox. Yeah. Yeah. Not radicalism. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. All right. Back to my so no Um uh oh my gosh. Yep. I totally forgot what I was going to talk about next. We've we talked about least. We've talked about a lot about the liminality. Um maybe we can talk about um I'm not someone who I said this in my first ever essay. I'm not a big theory person. I like to write collab theories with other people. But that being said, predictions are kind of fun. <laughs> so like, where where do we see Lysonomar going? Is he just like, when Young Griff is gonna fall, do we think Lysonomar is just gonna be beheaded? Like, well, wh where do we see this going? Cause he may not be on the front line. So if he sees like it's going to crap for Young Griff, maybe he does like varies and skedaddles, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. That would be very interesting because I mean, He's the sort of person who would do a virus and just like keep on swimming. Um, swimming. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe he does what Varys did in the show and jumps to Danny's ship. Uh, or maybe like he's like you said, he just like, oops, I'm just gonna go over here <laughs> and catch a ship to Liz. Um yeah. I don't know. I would like for him to survive, but also like King's Landing is going kaboom. This is so. true. I, I wonder, and this is something I've been, I'm going to, uh, and one of the bajillion 2021 essays coming at you is going to be my various essay, um, which I'm sure will, uh, I will also cite. 
Lowe's wonderful various essay in it as well, um, because it's inspired a couple thoughts for me. Um, I'm going to look at him and specifically Chinese eunuchs in history um, and kind of some parallels there. But something that I found interesting is that there was a, a Chinese eunuch designed the Forbidden City and knew all of the ins and outs and varies knows all the ins and outs of the Red Keep. So I have my head cannon. <laughs> but like so no more when 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 I do think they will take King's Landing. They will dethrone Cersei. I think that Lysonomar is going to be like, what's this? Oh, a whole underground tunnel system in Red Keep. And he's going to explore it and map it out. Uh, and then, and you know, well, Varys, if he's on their side, he might just be like, here's a map or I, I'll show you all of it, right? Mm. So I think that Varys and Lysonomar both will know the ins and outs of the Red Keep so that when it's going down, I think that, you know, whenever Danny does come to King's Landing on Dragonback, I think that Lysone Omar might be able to just go out through one of those escape routes and that is built in. This is my hope because I really like these kinds of various like Lysone Omar characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're crapped on so much that when, you know, shit goes down, they should be able to get, like just check out and just leave, right? Especially yeah. if they're not Westerosi. Right, like he could just go back to Lisa and live a great life and live his best life being, ex you know, I feel like in Lisa he doesn't get the kind of as many weird looks as he does mm. in Westeros for dressing how he does. Because like we said, Lisa's has, you know, is this, I has this extravagance and um, jewels and all of that everywhere. So him wearing jewelry, I don't think, you know, I feel like he'd just be happy. Just, just go back to Lisa Lysono. You're, you're too good for this world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But that, that's my headcanon low is that varies or will either show him or Lysonomar will find them himself like find these secret tunnels um anyone who's an avatar last year better saying secret tunnel sorry <laughs> just had to do it anytime i hear secret tunnel anyway uh the, but that's my head canon and i would really like that because i think that he and varies and these kinds of um characters that work in the shadows are all on your team until your team is not going to win and they realize that and then they just kind of go their loyalties mm -hmm. are only there you know when you are actually getting it done right yeah they don't see the need to go down with the ship like i think a lot of um a lot of the kind of frontline uh you know fighters and and schemers would yeah, and I mean, also they they know they're gonna get the blame. Yeah, I mean, everyone's gonna throw them under the bus. Uh, so why would they go down with the ship? They just like, oh, I mean, I'm the weird foreigner who everyone thinks is like queer in multiple senses of the world. Word, they're just gonna throw me on on the shopping block. So yeah, why would I stay? Yeah, and we in fire and blood. Um... I think with the Rogare family, the mm. banking family from Essos, uh, there was a, people that I've only read Fire and Blood once. I am due for a reread and to take actually take notes on it because when I was reading the series and um, reading Fire and Blood, I, I, was, I wasn't a content creator, so I don't have notes and I need to actually have notes, which is why it's taking me so long to finish the Poppy War because I'm taking <laughs> the most insane, meticulous notes. Um, but I do remember there was, I believe it was the Rogari family, but they were a banker family. And they basically, if I remember correctly, the Targaryens didn't want to constantly be reliant on the Bank of Bravos. And so they come over and they're like, don't worry, you can borrow from us, it's gonna be fine. And they really integrated themselves within the ruling family. Um, and then whenever shit went down, it was blamed on those foreigners. Like it's all their fault. When, you know, the Targaryens made the choices, they, you know, they put their stamp on all of these agreements and everything, but it was those foreigners were, you know, um, deceiving us, right? Yeah. And so I think yeah. that's what would happen with Lysone Omar is that if he did live uh, and like a little, or, and like he stayed with like a little, maybe young Griff escapes or something like a little tiny contingent escapes, they would, they would blame him for not foreseeing this, for not, you know, not having enough information about Danny and when she was coming, you know, any, any, any number of things. Yeah. Also, the Regaris are also from Lys. Uh, also from Lys. Okay. I knew, yeah. I just said Essos because I couldn't remember exactly and I didn't want to yeah. say Yeah. And uh, uh, one of the daughters of the family marries uh, Viserys the first? No. Okay. The, the, 
the his Viserys anyway. He she marries into the royal family, and she's the one that they uh, think is super weird because she uh, worships this yonder rose of the shadow god that is like gender fluid, and they're like. Yeah. She's transforming into a boy to have sexual adventures during night. Um, oh my god! And I it, love it's a whole what thing. I love about the you say Andros, I say Idros, whatever. The one with the, the Y. You can look it up on a, a Wiki of Ice and Fire, um, and decide for yourself. But what I love about the Yindros is that it's right. Like I said, with the Yin and Yang, which is gets me even more excited to talk about it. Right. The man is day and the sun and the woman mm. is night and the moon and you literally it's exactly as um as it would be in yin and yang um and you have this this um what is interesting about that is then there is a time technically we don't know how long it takes for this tr- alleged transformation but there is a time when it is neither when it is mm. not binary when it is and there's time where it is trans right so like when it's let's just put it on a on a on a uh, you know kind of a, a scale or, or kind of a sliding scale of like male over here, female over here. So when it's here, it's kind of trans and then all of a sudden it's non-binary and then it's trans the other way. And then finally kind of ends, you know? So mm. um, this, this religion, this God is actually presenting us with, with transness and when, with non-binariness. And this is another thing that I like about the Sphinx is that it transcends gender. And here you have a God that transcends it for a moment and then conforms and then transcends mm-hmm. and then conforms every day. Um, and so that that's, I don't, I don't know what's going on there, but I know there's something mm-hmm. <laughs> that's fascinating. Uh, and once again, George could have put this as the God, uh, one of the, one of the many gods in Bravos or, uh, you know, the God of Lorath. Why is it least, you know, he, he, I think he is consciously doing something with lease and femininity mm. and sexuality and transgressiveness yeah i think so too um and it's it's interesting <laughs> i'm just gonna put it it's interesting <laughs> yeah I, I don't know what to do with it you know i sometimes in analysis you can look at something and unpack it and sometimes you just go look at that thing that's interesting <laughs> and then move on and that's kind of what we did with andros in this essay because i don't know <laughs> what to do with it yeah i mean it's like Which makes it it's queer, right? exa- i don't know what to do with it it's so queer right you know so yeah it embodies it yeah it's just like to me it's an example of how west rosy would see um like both eastern people and like gender non-conforming people it's like it's weird it's suspicious we don't like it yeah. <laughs> and it it's embodied in that one god yeah it's very fascinating and like, and like I said, you know, there were eight other free cities. You know, you, you could have been a god in Slaver's Bay. You could have made a, another city and randomly and made that the god of it. So it's, it's made, could have made it a god of Summer Isles, right? It, it's, mm. it's just interesting that he picked these. Don't get me started on the Summer Isles. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be an essay someday. Mm. Yeah, when I was writing my, uh, my uh, Tyrion and Monkey um uh, imagery essay and I am going to write one on Marissa Coulter and her monkey because I'm obsessed with monkeys anyway uh yeah when I read that uh Summer Islanders the pretty much the black people of uh Planetos uh liked monkeys and had monkey pets I was like I'm not touching that with a 40 foot pole <laughs> jeez and also <laughs> really they're bad. very sexual and uh, yes. hyper sexualized and yeah. mo- must much more like in contact with nature and sexuality and i'm like hmm. yeah <laughs> and this is something that i was actually talking about on uh yesterday when we were streaming about on john webster film about return of the king the last mm-hmm. lord of the rings movie um it's a little i'm a little miffed that in every western fantasy the east is always like weird or even evil like in the east of you know mordor oh scary you know then you have here you have a shy and oh et like it's so weird what is going on there the shadow lands you know um so it's either like evil or weird or just or strange or it's something like lease where you go there to like pardon my language you go there to get your dick wet and then enjoy yourself and then go back to westeros right where where things make sense so it's mm-hmm. just like I think other than Ursula K. Le Guin's um, Earthsea series, I have not seen many Western fantasy where the the East isn't like just 
basically an orientalist trope i don't know how else to say it yeah i mean it's very clear in a song of and fire i think but i also think that you're she's doing that on purpose uh and like like with the the frog game for instance they're also very clear orientalist tropes and then danny gets to know them and he's like oh they're actually humans yeah. um so i mean i think he like we sort of talked about with Philip Pullman when we talked about Orientalism and colonialism in those books. It's like, I see that you're doing something. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're succeeding to 100%, but I see that you're trying to make a point. <laughs> yeah, I see what you're trying to do there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, and, and that's what I see a lot with um, whenever George has these kind of liminal characters. Um, He's definitely trying to do something with liminality um, and he's he's trying his best. I don't mean to crap on George this whole video, um, but you know, but at the same time, I think that recognizing the limits of it is also important because we can't just go, look, representation, <laughs> you know, and then yeah. be happy with that. We really need to kind of unpack it and what it's doing in the series um, and kind of for the overall um, kind of meta you know, uh, especially the end game kind of ideas. Mm. Um, and, you know, when it comes to, and I talk about this once again in my video with Through the Mo on Through the Moon Door, please check out his channel, um, with Danny and Orientalism is that, uh, you know, she kind of sees the people of Essos, many, she travels quite all over. She sees them as kind of weird and such. And that's exactly how she's going to be seen when she comes to Westeros. She's going to look like a Targaryen, which will be like, huh, my grandma told me about them. Like that's that's how that looks vaguely familiar. But other than that, they're gonna mm -hmm. be she's gonna be seen as SOC. She's gonna come with an SOC army. Uh, she would have had SOC husbands. Um, so it is kind of interesting to see how the um, how these exotic character exoticized characters such as Varys and Lysona Omar are seen with automatically with suspicion just because they're from the east. Mm. Um, and like, uh, you know, like we said, with Bro Blood Raven, we do have an example of a Westerosi uh, Master of Whispers, but he is very, seen as very weird because of his mm -hmm. alb albinism, his connection to the old gods, his being a bastard, um, and his generally, like, kind of creepiness. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, also very much his appearance. Like you said, he's, he's uh, albino. But also he has that big birthmark and later in life he loses an eye. So there's definitely some ableism things going on there too. Yeah. And I, I just, I, I found it hard to find a master of whispers who wasn't marginalized. He was just mm. like a normal dude. Like the hands of the king can just be like a normal dude, like from House Hightower or Baratheon or whatever. Um, yeah. And you don't see an example of that. And, and you know, maybe... And Fire and Blood too, we'll see that, but I just haven't, I haven't seen it anywhere. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, statistically, there has to be some normal person. Yes, but that's not what the examples we're given. So the impression that we get from the text is that it's the weird people that's the master of whispers because it's it's not a desirable position. Yeah. Okay, so let's do some final thoughts, Lo. Is there something about Lysonomar, about um, transness or liminality, something that you definitely want to say your piece before we go? Um, I think just like in general, that my point with a lot of my trans readings of of different characters in Ace Wolf is not to do like, oh, this person is trans, this person is genderqueer, this person is this modern identity category. It's more like looking at the structures and looking how people um, transgress those structures and norms and boundaries and what the effects of that is, because that's something I think is uh, very interesting to look at because that tells us about the structures of society. If someone like Ariane is like, hmm, this person is weird because he doesn't conform to the norms I'm expecting him to conform to, then that tells us something about the norms. Um, so I don't think we need, we don't always have to be like, this person is definitely this identity. Yeah. It's more like, look at the effects that they're causing when they're moving through society. Um, 
And I think that is exceptionally clear with Lysa on Omar, which is always interesting to talk about. Yeah. And I guess for my final thoughts, I, I really, what I really enjoyed about this essay is finding a character that uh, is, is a little self-serving for both of us, but I'm the, the basically brought our two kind of uh, things that, that we're experts in and just kind of merged them with my, my interest in Orientalism and your interest in um, queer analysis and both of our interests in feminist analysis. We kind of just bring them together. Um, and so I, I really liked that and, and that George offers us so many different types of characters that we can kind of, um, you know, people that uh, in the fandom that focus on military strategy like to talk about Stannis or, you know, in certain battles and all of that. They, anyone in the fandom can find something to talk about. And so I, I really appreciated, you know, writing this with you and being able to talk about it with you. And I look forward to our next project on the Poppy War. So that'll be exciting. Yes, thank you. It was a blast to do to talk to you as always, and Eleanor, I think with you. Yes. So um. So you. go ahead and let us know what is uh, coming up on Queer Musings in your uh, blog. Yes. Uh. So later this week, depending on when this video is up, uh, within a week, uh, my analysis of the last episode of Historic Materials uh, season two will be up. Uh, not to spoil people, but there will po I will have to dry my tears, probably, <laughs> before. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming, and I don't want it to come, but I know it's coming. Yeah, um, but yeah, what I've been doing with those analyses is just like talking about the episode, but also uh, applying some sort of feminist, post-colonial something lens on things. I've been talking about indigenous people in Scandinavia. I've been talking about Marxism. I've been talking about liberal feminism. I've been talking about Foucault uh, and just applying loads of different theories to the events of the episodes. Um, and there, the, those anal analysis are spoilers for the main three books for the majority of it. And then I have a s extra spoilery section at the end that I've called Dusty Thoughts. Uh, nice. Which, uh, Similar to the, the discussion book. on Girls Gone Canon. Yeah, I, I, that was like a blatant steal, essentially. <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, yeah, I, I'm always inspired by Girls Gone Canon. They're amazing. Uh, yes. Definitely. And then, um, yeah, so that's coming up. And then I'm doing some more ASWAP things. I'm probably writing. Um, I think the next one I'm going to write is about the concept and construction of virginity and maidenhood and patriarchal control. Oh, uh, my God. I'm so excited. Because uh, I'm sure uh, you'll talk about the maiden of the of the seven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I'll talk about the Ooh. non-existence of the maiden head. Yes, <laughs> it doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, stop, because stop it. <laughs> that uh, the because crap out of me. yeah, fun fact for those who don't know: when I'm not doing whatever else I'm doing online, uh, I'm also a sex educator, and I work uh, in sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, organization and activism. So. I have a lot of feelings and <sighs> so many feelings about whenever people in this series are like, "Oh, that person is not a maiden because we have checked their vagina." It's and like, like that's not how oh. it works. Not how it works. Um, and then I'm also planning an essay about uh, the Night of the Laughing Tree. That's going to be part theory, part analysis. Yay! That's exciting. Yeah, and sometime oh. I'm also going to write an essay. Uh, this is contingent on when Eliana finishes uh, The Secret Commonwealth, because I've said when Eliana finishes The Secret Commonwealth, I'm going to write an essay about uh, moving through space as a marginalized person in the context of The Secret Commonwealth and what it's like to move through uh, the world when you don't fit in, essentially. Fascinating. Oh boy, that's exciting. So please um, follow Lo on Twitter and their blog. You can also, if you have a WordPress account, you can follow that just directly and then you'll get straight to your inbox whenever they have uh, posted uh, some new analysis. So please check them out. Um, so now it's time for my copious amounts of plugs. Um, yes, like I said, this December 22nd on my channel, I'm going live. This is my first time going live on my channel with a guest. 
Um, and yes, it's going to be 5 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to have John Webster of John Webster Film, my fellow co-host um, over at John Webster Film. We are going to once again talk about his topic of choice for my first episode of Buddy Banter. And we are going to talk about uh, gender stereotypes and how that affects the way the type of media we consume and how we consume it. Um, and once again, I'm on John Webster Film every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern streaming about some, um, one movie or another. And we just finished up a three week marathon of the Lord of the Rings and we're gonna do them up at Christmas Carol this Saturday. Um, so happy holidays, everyone. And we're going to do Wonder Woman 1984 on January 2nd. We also, we got a lot coming in January. We're also gonna talk about X-Men, the first movie with our good friend, Kelly, the Jaded Redhead. We're gonna talk about Mean Girls. It's gonna be really fun. So please um, subscribe to John Webster Film and you'll see me over there. Uh, if you can't catch us live, then please watch later. We really appreciate all of your comments and everything on Twitter. Um, and yeah, like I said, the, that, that live stream and this video will be it for me on this channel for December. Um, but boy, do I have a lot of stuff coming at you in January. So please be sure to subscribe to the channel and follow me on Twitter. I am Amy Poehler, that's P-O-L-L-E-R uh, on Twitter. I mean, I'm Amy Blackfire on Twitter, but I'm also Amy Poehler on Twitter and that I pull the crap out of all everyone. Uh, my latest poll has uh, 550 votes last time I checked. Uh, so I'm really enjoying everyone's feedback. Uh, and if you comment on the poll with your thoughts, you might make it into my videos. I gave someone a shout, I gave Maddie a shout out um, in our my Cersei video that I did with Rohan. And please check out that Cersei video if you haven't. Um, and yes, there's a lot coming in 2021. And like I said, Lo will be back. And uh, even after that Poppy War essay, I'm sure I'm gonna drag them back on to talk about something queer. Um, so thank you very much, Lo, for coming on. And um, I, I, one more plug, I'm sorry. Leap the Patriarchy, December 30th. Lo's coming on the Unspun Yarn. I am co I co-host Bleep the Patriarchy. This is gonna be our second episode. Nessie and I are gonna have them and Ian Thomas Malone on. And we are going to talk about transphobia and turfism and why it's bad. So we're gonna have a really good time about that with that. Um, so thank you again, Lo, and I will see you next time, everyone. Bye.